I once preached to a congregation of dogs, mostly Labrador breed, and they gave me incredible attention. Believe me? It was a guest service, and each of the dogs had brought a guest who was blind. Ah, now you believe me. You should believe me the first time. <laughs> it was the annual Torch Trust rally for the blind, and a lot of them had brought their guide dogs. And blind people usually listen to you with their head on one side like that, but the dogs listened like this. <laughs> and they watched this man waving his arms about. And uh, when I looked at the congregation, all I could see were these dogs' eyes looking at me. That morning, I'd said to the Lord, what should I preach to these blind people about? And he said, preach about hell. And I thought, I can't do that. They're handicapped. They've suffered. They need a word of comfort and encouragement. But the Lord said, preach about hell. So I talked about a verse from the Sermon on the Mount. It is better to lose your sight and enter into life than to keep your eyes and go to hell. I said, do you blind people ever pray for those of us who are sighted? Because most of our temptations come through our eyes. It's called the lust of the eyes. I said, you pray for us. And there was an elderly lady there, 84 I believe she was, and she'd been blind from birth and never been able to see and she was very resentful and bitter about this. But for the first time in her whole life, she felt pity for me because I could see. And all the bitterness left her heart, and she opened her heart to the Lord. And on the bus back to Harrogate that day, she, they told me she sang hymns all the way. And she died the following Thursday. The first person she ever saw was Jesus. It wasn't the first time I've preached on hell, but I haven't done it frequently. And have you noticed that very few are doing these days? seems to have dropped right out. In fact, if you want to hear the word again, go and work among unbelievers and you'll hear it all the time. It's being treated uh, simply as an expletive now. But blasphemy is one way to take the edge off it and take the fear away, to use the word so frequently that it loses its meaning. Have you ever heard about Charlie Dryhole Woods? Sure you haven't, but Charlie Woods got the nickname Dryhole because he was always drilling for oil in his backyard and never found any. But he actually found the biggest gusher in California and it yielded something like 18,000 barrels a day. Well, at its peak it got up to 85,000 barrels and nobody teased Charlie Dryhole Woods anymore. But when he got the first gusher, which came pouring out this black stuff, he was being interviewed by a reporter and this is what he said to the reporter. He said, it's hell, literally hell. It roars like hell, it mounts, surges and sweeps like hell. It's as uncomfortable as hell and uncontrollable hell. It's black and hot as hell. Which is rather overdoing the word, don't you think? But you see, when you use the word as freely as that, it loses its fear. It no longer means what it originally meant. That's one way that the world is laughing it off. The second way in which the world laughs off the idea of hell is to make it a subject of comedy. And it's quite a tribute to the communication of the church that most people outside know what the word hell means. And it's quite amazing how many jokes comedians make about hell, about its temperature, about the company there, about all kinds of things. That's another way in which the edge has been taken off it and people no longer fear it then hell has also been reinterpreted in an existential way. I mean by that, people say, you make your own hell on earth. Have you heard that phrase? Well, of course, that does two things. First of all, it brings hell this side of death, so it's not to be feared beyond death. It also means that no longer does God make the decision or the Lord Jesus make the decision to send someone to hell. You do it for yourself. So if you go there, it's your decision, not his. And again, in a very subtle way, the edge has been taken off it. Well, now that's how the people outside are talking about hell. What is amazing is that the church inside has stopped talking about it. And it seems to have disappeared. And we're going to see in a moment that the serious side of that is that many preachers, evangelical preachers, no longer believe in it. Even though Jesus apparently did. 
So we've got quite a serious subject before us. People have an aversion to the doctrine of hell. I'm not surprised. It's the most offensive and disturbing doctrine in the Christian faith. I wish I didn't have to include it. But I'm talking about those things in the future which are absolutely certain. And this is one of those four things about which we can be absolutely sure. Hell is real. If it's not, then Jesus was a liar, and I'm not prepared to say that. Arguments have been used against hell, even within the church. I'm talking about the church now and believers. Arguments are being used by scholars and theologians to argue hell out of existence. And they usually do it by taking one attribute of God and making that the whole of God and then arguing from that that hell cannot possibly coexist with it. You heard earlier that the glory of God is the sum of all his attributes. And it's very dangerous to take any one of those attributes and make that the foundation of your thinking. Let me explain what I mean. Some people take the love of God which is one of his attributes, and they make it the whole, and therefore they say, how could a God of love send anyone to hell? As much as to argue, if I loved people, I couldn't do that to them. How can God love people and do that to them? Or else, some others have argued from God's power, and they say, if God is all-powerful, then he cannot fail in what he sets his mind to. Therefore, if he sets his mind to get everyone to heaven, he can achieve that. His power is able to do it. And therefore, if anyone finishes up in hell, then God has failed. He is weak. And his power, he is not omnipotent. His power is inadequate to save everybody. Then there are those who take his justice and say, is it just to punish for all eternity a few years of vice or crime? Is it fair that people like Saddam Hussein and my nice next door neighbor finish up in the same place? And so they take God's justice and argue from that against hell. Now all these are doing exactly the same thing. They're taking part of God's character and making it the whole. But each of his attributes qualifies the others. And they all blend together. In other words, God is not just love. He is holy love. That makes a big difference. His holiness qualifies his love. And however much as he loves us, his holiness cannot allow sin to go on forever. So that his love is qualified by his holiness. His power is qualified by his love. He will not force anyone to go to heaven. He doesn't want people in heaven who are there involuntarily. He wants people freely to choose to be in his family. And that qualifies his power. He could make us all be good. But he has chosen not to because he wants sons and not robots in glory. So all these are arguing from part of God instead of from the whole of God. And that's a mistake many Christians make. They see the nice side and they don't like the other side. But the New Testament says, Behold then the goodness and the severity of God. They belong together. And to get a big view of God, you need the whole counsel of God and the whole truth. So these theologians and scholars who are arguing against hell as incompatible with at least part of God's character, what do they propose to put in its place? What are the alternatives that are being preached today? And there are two main ones. We could go through a whole lot, but there are two big ones that are being widely preached today. One alternative to hell is being preached by those we call liberals who do not accept the total inspiration and authority of Scripture. Alas, the other alternative is now being preached by those who do accept the inspiration and authority of Scripture, believe it or not. So what are the two alternatives? Now, I'm sorry to give you two rather big words now, and they both end in ism. Always beware of words that end with the three letters ISM, because most of the words that end ism have a demonic power to become an obsession with people. 
even when the religious isms, Anglicanism, Methodism. <laughs> there are only two isms that I'm happy with. One is baptism <laughs> and the other is evangelism. But apart from those, beware of every ism because they have this capacity to obsess someone. But here are the two isms that are being proposed in place of hell. Number one, universalism. Now, this is the liberal alternative to hell. And universalism believes that someday, somehow, everybody will land up in heaven. It involves believing that after death there will be a second chance and a third and a fourth and a fifth, indeed indefinite number of opportunities to be saved so that people may decide later to go to heaven even if they didn't decide before they died. And of course there is the added incentive that if you find yourself in hell you've got a real incentive to choose heaven. So that's universalism. Actually it has two forms, sorry to get complicated, but universalism has two forms, one of which says one day everybody will be saved, but there's a modern version of it that says everybody is already saved that since Jesus died for the world, everybody is saved and all we need to do is to tell them that they're saved. The present Pope has committed himself to this view, that all people have been redeemed by Christ, whether they believe or not. They've all redeemed, they're all on the way to heaven. The task of the church is to tell them they're going there, to tell them they're saved. That's the good news. Well, now, both forms of universalism, of course, have no room for hell at all. Either we're all going to be saved or we already all have been saved. Either way, everybody's heading for heaven. That's the universal bit of the universalism. Now, evangelicals who believe in the inspiration and authority of the Bible cannot, of course, accept that because the Bible makes it quite clear that there will be a division on the day of judgment between the saved and the lost, between the guilty and the acquitted. There is a black and white division in Scripture between those on the broad way that leads to destruction and those on the narrow way that leads to life. You can't get round this division of the human race in Scripture. So what is the alternative to hell being preached now by leading evangelicals in this country? The answer is annihilationism. Sorry about the ism again, but I'm sure you understand the word. This believes that sinners simply cease to be. They go into oblivion. They don't suffer in hell. They become nothing. Again, there are two versions of this. One believes that sinners become nothing at the moment of death. The other believes that sinners become nothing after the day of judgment. And appeal is made to some parts of Scripture, for example, that hell is fire, that fire destroys, uh, you can't survive in fire, that eternal punishment doesn't refer to the eternal suffering, but the eternal effect of being annihilated. Well, I would have thought it was pretty eternal to be annihilated. But that is how they get round the phrase eternal punishment, that it's eternal in its effect, but not in its experience. Now, all that is the kind of argument that is now a hot debate. You have seen it in magazines. You have seen in one national Christian magazine a lady writing a letter who just said, I could not love a God who would send anyone to hell. That's where she stood. That's what she says. Well, frankly, it's saying that Jesus didn't know what he was talking about because we know everything we know about hell from the lips of Jesus. Did you know that? God didn't trust anybody else to tell us such a terrible truth. We don't know about it from John or Paul or Peter. There's not a word about hell in the Old Testament. Everything we know comes from the lips of Jesus himself. And yet if there was anyone who knew God, well, it was surely his son. He knew all about God's love and God's power and God's justice, and yet still he taught hell. And so we turn to the teaching of Jesus. And before I look at it in detail, I want to explain something. I want to give you a framework of thinking which you need before you can understand the rest of what I'm going to say. This is the framework. Human existence is in three phases. Th 
three stages, not two. It's a very common idea, even inside church, that you die and you go to heaven or hell. That is based on a framework of two phases. But from what I've already said about the Day of Judgment, you know that there are three phases of human existence. Phase number one is the one that we're all in right now. That's this world in which I am an embodied spirit. At death, my spirit and body are separated. And I'm finished with my body. It's only an overcoat that I've worn. And my second phase of existence will be that of a disembodied spirit. Now, I've never been that, so it's going to be a new experience. And like Paul, I'm not quite sure about it at this stage. And yet equally, I'm with Paul sure that it'll be far better than this life with a body. But Paul did say I'd, I'd rather go straight from phase one to phase three, from my old body to my new body. But even so, if I have to be unclothed, as he put it, I'd rather be absent from the body and present with the Lord, which is far better. So phase two is where you are absent from the body. And if you know the Lord, you're present with the Lord. It's almost irrelevant to ask where that will be because without a body, you don't ask where. <laughs> you don't need to be located, as it were. Spirits are not subject to the same dimensional existence as bodies are. So it's really quite irrelevant to ask where will that be. The important thing is who will you be with? And you'll be with the Lord, fully conscious, able to communicate, but without a body. Phase three comes later when we all together get a new body and become again embodied spirits and full human beings in the total sense. Now you realize, do you, that Jesus went through all these three phases himself in less than a week. On the day he died, his body and his spirit separated and he gave up his spirit to God who gave it. For the next three days and nights, he was fully conscious and fully active and communicating with others. We know that from Simon Peter, who has told us in his letter. I imagine that Jesus told Peter this when he met him on the first Easter Sunday. We don't know where they met or what was said. We just know that he appeared to Peter. But I imagine that Peter said to him, Jesus, where on earth have you been? And Jesus said, I haven't been on earth. I've been in Hades, the world of the departed. And Peter would say, but what on earth have you been doing? For th Sorry, what in Hades have you been doing for three days? And Jesus said, I've been preaching. Preaching? Who to? He said, I've been preaching to those who were drowned in the days of Noah's flood. Now, what an extraordinary tidbit of information. Seems to me proof that nobody invented the Bible. Who would have thought that up? So Jesus was fully conscious and fully communicating. More than that, the people who had been drowned in Noah's flood were fully conscious and able to communicate. And two minutes after you're dead, you'll be fully conscious, you'll know who you are, you'll be able to communicate. If you're with the Lord, how exciting that will be. Somebody asked me after I said that, what about one minute after you're dead? Okay, one minute after you're dead. One second after you're dead. You will be fully conscious. You don't go into oblivion. Jesus didn't. We won't but we go into that disembodied spirit phase. Heaven and hell belong to the third phase. And that's what I want to get across now. They are both places for people with bodies. That's very important. I don't uh, use the phrase go to heaven. I'll tell you more in the last talk. But uh, this talking about going to heaven or hell when you die is quite misleading. Nobody's in hell yet, not even Satan. It's an uninhabited place. Interesting that Jesus spoke of both heaven and hell with the same word. He said both are being prepared. I go to prepare a place for you. And depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting punishment, prepared for the devil and his angels. Both heaven and hell are at the moment in a state of preparation. They're not yet inhabited. So I prefer to say somebody who's died in faith has gone to be with the Lord, which is how the New Testament talks. Not where they are, but who they're with. That is the important thing in that middle phase. So have you got this framework, this threefold phase? The Bible tells us very little about the middle phase. It concentrates our thinking on the final phase beyond the resurrection and the judgment. And that's the hell I'm talking about. 
not talking about anything in between, I'm talking about that beyond the resurrection. Well, now that's what Jesus talked about, and I want to look at how he described it first. Now, I suppose we all have a mental picture of hell. Usually we've picked it up from some experience we've had, a bad experience, and I can think of two. Whenever I hear the word hell, two fairly recent experiences come back to my mind. The first was about five years ago. I was in Hong Kong with a lady called Jackie Pullinger. I'm sure many of you have heard of her experiences in the walled city of Hong Kong. Well, she took me into the walled city. Uh, the first surprise was there's no wall. I imagined this big stone wall, but it was torn down by the Japanese during the war and thrown into the harbor to make the runway for the aircraft. And when you land in a jumbo, you're landing on the wall of the walled city. But the walled city itself is still there, and it's a pile of shanty, shanty houses, 15 or 20 stories high, just piled on top of each other. And it's a tiny bit of Hong Kong that is not owned by the British. It is not owned by anybody. Therefore, in that tiny city, which can't be much more than about ten times the size of this room, there is no law. There are no police. You can do anything you like in that city. And you can imagine that crime and vice flourish. It's where the triads have their headquarters, where the pimps and prostitutes live, it's where the drug dealers live. Can't be touched. I see it's got to be pulled down before Hong Kong is handed back to China. And you go in a, a little sort of opening, and the place is so dark inside, if you're visiting someone on the top floor, you climb up through everybody else's room to get there. And the filth, the sewage, the rats, indescribable. The only bright room in it was right in the middle on the ground floor, the room where Jackie Pullinger prays for drug addicts. An amazing lady. When I came out into the sunlight after being in that horrid, dark, dismal, depressing place full of vice and crime, instinctively I said, I've just been to hell. That was about five years ago. But about two years ago I had something worse. I was in Poland and I went to a place called Ossiewicz, which you probably know as Auschwitz. That's the German name that was given to Ossiewicz, the Polish name. And there I went and stood in a bare chamber, much smaller than this room. It had no windows. It had two doors, one at one end, one at the other. There were what looked like shower heads in the ceiling. But through those shower heads came the deadly Zikon B gas that put hundreds and hundreds to death. They used to force men, women, and children into that room. 250 at a time, they could hardly move. They were told they were going to have a shower, so they left their clothes outside, and then they were gassed. Then they cut their hair off to stuff cushions, pulled the gold out of their teeth with pliers. If they had tattoos on their skin, they carefully took them off to make lampshades. They melted their fat down to make soap. Then they burned the bodies to ashes and sold it off as fertilizer. And from coming into the camp to being sold off as fertilizer took one and a half hours. I stood alone in that chamber. I felt I was in hell. Interesting, I opened my paper last week and Princess Anne had been to Auschwitz. And that was her title as well. Princess in hell. Well, we've all got our pictures, our experiences, and yet none of them really is like the picture Jesus gave us. Let's go to Jesus. How did he think of hell? The answer is really quite simple. He thought of hell as a rubbish dump, a garbage dump. He always called it Gehenna, and that's Hebrew for the Valley of Hinnom. And that's a real valley. It's just outside the city of Jerusalem, but tourists never see it. One reason is it's too deep. And when you're in the city, the old city of Jerusalem, you're just not aware of the valley. You have to go out of the south gate and look down to see it. It's there, right down. So deep and so dark that the sun doesn't touch one part of the bottom of that valley. And when I first went to Israel in 1961, that valley was still being used 
for the same purpose as in Jesus' day. And the smoke was rising out of it and I looked down here was all the rubbish from the city being incinerated. And down there, I went down into the valley, the rotten food was there and the maggots were there. The picture was there and Jesus said, where the fire never goes out and the worms never die. He said, Gehenna. That valley, you can't see it now, it's been landscaped, it's now a public park in a beautiful valley. But you can still go and walk through it. It's just outside the city. And the gate on the south wall is significantly called the Dung Gate. And you can guess why. It's where they took all the sewage and tipped it in the valley. All the rubbish went down there and it was just kept burning to try and keep it low. That's what it always has been. But way, way back in the Old Testament period, that valley had some very sinister associations. It was down in the bottom of that valley that God's own people, Israel, worshipped a horrible pagan god who didn't exist called Moloch. And the god Moloch demanded human sacrifice. And there, down in the bottom of that valley, they burned alive their own babies to Moloch. If you read Jeremiah, Jeremiah said this valley will be called a valley of desolation. And from then on it became the rubbish dump of the city. A horrible place. Now it has some other associations too. A crucified criminal was never buried. His body was taken off the cross and thrown into the valley of Gehenna for the maggots to eat and the birds to pick up. That might have happened to our Lord Jesus had Joseph of Arimathea not come forward and said, have my tomb. Jesus might have finished up in Gehenna, but for Joseph. One of the twelve disciples did finish up there. Judas hanged himself and he put a rope over a tree at the top of the cliff overlooking the valley of Hinnom and he threw himself off and the rope broke and his body tumbled down and it says in crude language his bowels gushed out when he hit the bottom. It became known as the field of blood. And if you ask the Israeli guide he'll show you the field of blood at the bottom of that valley. That's the valley we're talking about. The valley where all the rubbish is thrown where everything useless is thrown, where everything dirty is thrown, to get rid of it. Jesus said, if you want a picture of hell, just go and go out of the south gate and look down. That's my idea of hell. It brings to vivid light the word perish, because the word perish doesn't mean to cease to be. It means to cease to be useful. If you've got a, a hot water bottle that's perished, or a car inner tube that's perished, has it ceased to be? No. Still looks like a hot water bottle. The only trouble is you can't use it as a hot water bottle because it's perished. And that's the literal meaning of the word perish in Scripture. It doesn't mean to be annihilated. It means to be ruined. When a woman poured ointment all over Jesus, Judas Iscariot said that ointment has perished. Useless now. Been wasted. It is said of the prodigal son that he was wasted, that he was perished, that he was ruined, lost. That's the word for lost. And here is the greatest tragedy that can ever happen to a human being, that a person made in the image of God, made to serve God's purposes, has so perished that God says, I can't use that person anymore. They are rubbish in my universe. And the phrase, go to hell, is not in Scripture. The phrase that Jesus always used was, thrown into hell. Because that's precisely what you do with rubbish, isn't it? You always throw it away. And that's the verb that is always used, thrown into. And Jesus was very careful to say that your body and soul would be ruined in hell. Not just your soul, but your body. That's why I said hell is a place for people with bodies. Therefore, it is not a place you go to when you die, but a place you go to after resurrection. So, that's what Jesus' picture was. A picture of a rubbish dump for people who are wasted. Just to slip in a little good news. God is in the recycling business. That is what salvation means. 
Too many people think saved means safe. It doesn't. I'll show you that next talk. But it means salvaged. And salvage is the nearest English equivalent to salvation. And it means to take rubbish and recycle it and make it useful again. Now there's an intriguing little letter in the New Testament written to a man called Philemon about a slave called Onesimus. Did you know what Onesius, Onesimus means? Onesimus means useful. Isn't that amazing? And that slave called useful ran away from home, found his way to Rome where he thought he could hide, made the biggest mistake of his life, he met up with Paul. Gets converted. Paul says, you've got to go back to your master. Oh, but he'll kill me. I ran away from him. No, I know him. He's a Christian. I will write a letter to cover you. And Paul wrote that lovely letter and said, if he took any of your money, I'll pay it back. But listen, he really has become useful again. He's recycled. You found him useless, says Paul, but you'll find him on Esimus now. It's a lovely pun in that little letter. And it's a picture of redemption. It's precisely what Jesus has done with all of us. He's sending us back to God and saying, he's useful again, God. She's useful again. She was no use to you. She was running away from you. He was running away from you. But I've recycled him. That's what salvation is. It's to be recycled so that rubbish doesn't finish up in the rubbish dump, but becomes useful to God again. What a picture that is. Well, Jesus not only described hell, but he also gave us a very clear understanding of what it would be like to experience it. And I just want to finish this talk by telling you five things he said hell would be like to experience. First, he said, be a place of intense physical discomfort. For one thing, there'll be no natural light there, total darkness. You may have your eyes, but you won't see anything. There's no light there at all. Kept calling it outer darkness. He said it'll be a very thirsty place where you'll beg for a drop of water. That's because it'll be a very hot place. Extreme heat, which is one of the most unpleasant experiences we have. He also said it would be a very smelly place. Sulfur is an element in most of the worst smells there are. And decaying putrefaction is one of the worst smells on earth. Hell will be a smelly place. Physical discomfort, a place of mental depression. Strange, Jesus said there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, but those seem to be contradictory. Weeping is sorrow, gnashing of teeth is anger. How could you have sorrow and anger at the same time? The answer is very simple. They both come together in frustration. And when you know the chances you did have and the chances you've missed and that you can never have them back again, there is a mixture of self-pity and sorrow and anger with yourself and anger with God. And it is this strange weeping and gnashing of teeth which Jesus kept repeating which points to this mental depression. It's a place of moral depravity. Can you imagine having to live forever with people who are totally depraved, who have lost all image of God, who are behaving like animals? A place where every vice and crime is practiced. A place where you have to live with it all. A place of utter moral depravity. No goodness there at all. No patience, no kindness, no love. I wonder if people realize that when you choose to live without God, you choose to live without goodness at the same time. Because all the good things that human beings are capable of comes from God. It's part of his image still left in us. And when that image is totally perished, that's the bit that goes. Therefore, it will be a place of social deprivation. You can be in the middle of a huge crowd and be totally lonely. Right? Now, why are you lonely in a crowd? It's when you feel that nobody takes any interest in you, nobody cares for you, nobody loves you. And you can be surrounded by thousands of people, but if nobody cares for you and loves you, you can feel desperately alone. I believe everybody in hell will feel that social deprivation. Because once again, it's only God that's made love possible. Family love, friendship, it won't be there. And therefore, finally, it will be a place of utter spiritual desolation. There'll be no prayer there. What's the point of praying when there's no God to hear you? There'll be no worship there. 
What's the point of worshipping when there's nobody to worship? See, the worst thing about hell is that you have to live without God. Now people say, well, that's not so bad. I'm living without him now. No, you're not. In this world, nobody's living without God. His spirit is still touching people, still pleading with them, still restraining them from being as bad as they really are. But listen, when God takes the brakes off, we don't go uphill, we go downhill. When God takes his hands off, Romans 1 that we looked at last time, in Romans 1 it says, men gave God up. So what did God do? It says, God gave men up. And the results were pretty horrifying. See, if God gave you up totally, you would not be a better person. You'd be a very much worse person than you are. None of us knows how much restraint there has been in our life through the influence of parents or friends that have held us back from doing what we might have done. Sometimes you discover your real self when the restraints come off. When you're away from home and nobody knows where you are, that's when you find out who you really are. That's what hell will be like. Spiritual deadness. Nobody will ever have a thought about spiritual things. Well, that's what we choose. If we choose to live without God. We can't get right away from God here, but God can get right away from us in that third phase of our existence. Well, there are other things to say about hell, but that's enough for this time. And we'll come together again to talk later. Well, now let me continue talking about this sombre subject. And I particularly want to begin now with this very serious question, how long will hell last? You see, even some annihilationists who believe we're heading for oblivion if we're sinners, some of them do believe we go to hell for a little bit of suffering before we're obliterated. Frankly, all this means that annihilation is good news. And perhaps that's why those who believe this don't preach it, because it would have the wrong effect on people. But actually, if I'm a sinner and I've sinned for 70, 80 years and got away with it, oblivion is great news, isn't it? And even if I'm sent to hell for a bit, there's still the good news. There is a hope in hell, a hope of being obliterated. So in fact, it's good news is annihilation. But let's look at this. How long does anyone suffer in hell? The traditional answer has always been forever. But that answer is being very widely questioned, I have to say, it mainly by Anglican evangelicals right now. But what does Jesus say? Now, I think the whole question has been approached from the wrong angle. And the angle that most of the discussion is taking place today is how long will human beings suffer in hell? Whereas I believe we've got to approach that question from another angle. You see, hell was never prepared for human beings. God never intended any human beings to go there. He prepared it, says Jesus, for the devil and all his angels. He didn't prepare it for us. In the sheep and the goats parable, it's not a parable really, it's a prophecy, but in that story, Jesus says to the goats, depart from me, you cursed into the everlasting punishment prepared for the devil and his angels. God prepares heaven for us, but he prepared hell for the devil and his angels, whom we call demons. And that's about a third of the angels in existence who have sided with Satan and rebelled against God, according to Revelation chapter 12. But you can read the whole chapter to find out the actual verse. Now then, why did God have to prepare hell for the devil and his angels? The answer is very simple. Jesus said, angels cannot die. Now, angels are real creatures, but they are creatures. They're part of God's creation. They are higher in the order of creation than us. We are not the peak of God's creation. Angels are. Evolutionists somehow have difficulty with that conception because... Where did the angels come from? Monkeys or 
wherever. You see, they're in problems. But we believe in angels. They are more intelligent than we are. They are stronger than we are. They are more flexible than we are. They are swifter in travel than we can be. They are superior to us in every way. And in one particular, they are very superior. We are mortal, but angels are immortal. I don't mean by that that they always existed. They had a beginning, as we do. But they have no end. They cannot die, whereas we can. And that is why angels don't marry or reproduce. They are a fixed number. They cannot increase or decrease. They are there, and God created them immortal. So since one-third of them have rebelled against God and are now evil angels, or demons we call them, and they cannot die, what does God do with them? And the answer is he prepares a place where they can be isolated from his universe. It's because they cannot die that he had to prepare the place to shut them up and shut them off from influence. Now, once we start there, we ask then if they are immortal and in hell, this isolated place forever, what is their experience in that place? And the answer of the Bible is crystal clear. The devil and his angels will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now, there could not be a clearer or stronger statement in the Bible than that. They are immortal, they are confined to hell, and they suffer. Torment, and that word means conscious pain. It can mean nothing else. Day and night, which means without any let up, forever and ever. And there is no stronger statement in the Greek language than forever and ever. It can only mean forever and ever. It literally, translated, says, unto the ages of the ages. That's a very, very long, long, long time. So, what do the annihilationists do with those statements about the devil and his angels being tormented forever and ever? The answer is they ignore them. Or they dismiss them, but they will not face them. But there are some who do say, all right, let's accept that the angels suffer in hell forever, but human beings won't. But there is nothing in the Bible, whatever, to suggest that there is any difference of destiny between the devil and his angels and human beings who join them. None at all. And in fact, we have clear statements that human beings will be tormented forever and ever. For example, in that one verse where it says the devil will be tormented day and night forever and ever, it says he will be tormented with the beast and the false prophet forever and ever. And those two at least are human beings. All antichrists are human beings and all false prophets are human beings. And so we, here we have at least two human beings of whom it is said they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then we have another much larger group mentioned. Those people who in that final rule of that world dictator called the antichrist who submit to having his number laser beamed onto their flesh so that they can buy and sell at the supermarket. And that is an entirely credible scenario now, since most of us are using numbers anyway on plastic, and they're already talking about tattooing or laser beaming numbers on your hand or your face, so you can just go to the checkout and put your hand in the machine, and everything will be debited to you. Now it says in the book of Revelation that is how buying and selling will be done in the last days. And it will take a great deal of courage to refuse to carry that number on your flesh. Because you will then not be able to buy and sell. You'll be out of the market. Not be able to get enough food. And it says of those who accept that number in order to buy food, that they will be tormented forever and ever. The same phrase, to the ages of the ages. And when Jesus says to the goats, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal punishment prepared for the devil and his angels, the plainest, simplest meaning of that language is, your destiny is the same as theirs. It is for that reason that, though I hate to say it and wish I didn't have to say it, that I believe the traditional understanding of hell as everlasting torment 
is what our New Testament teaches. <coughs> that makes it very horrible, but I believe it to be the truth. I can't get round the plain statements of Scripture. Let me then go to another serious question, and probably the biggest shock that you'll get today. Who goes to hell? What do you have to do to qualify? Now, there are two groups dealt with in Scripture. One are carefree sinners, those who just do not listen to their conscience, who simply do what they want to do. And altogether, there are 120 sins listed in the New Testament that could take a person to hell. It's a frightening number. They're usually in separate lists of about anywhere between half a dozen and ten in each list. There are two lists on the last two pages of the Bible. And when you look at those lists and put them all together, you've got 120 things that care, carefree sinners are doing that are on the broad road that leads to hell. As you would guess, sexual immorality figures frequently in those lists. Uh, whether fornication, sex before marriage or adultery sex after marriage with a partner other than your own. Uh, those figure quite uh, frequently. So does homosexual activity. And how can we be silent when we know things could take a person into the kind of suffering that we've been talking about? But it's a mistake if you think that sexual immorality is the main thing on those lists. There are plenty of other things on the list. Idolatry occurs frequently. Now, we may say, well, that doesn't touch me, thank God. I've never bowed down to a lump of wood or stone and worshipped it. But when you find out that in those lists, greed is classified as idolatry, you have to think again. It's interesting that the commandment that most people have most difficulty with is the tenth, thou shalt not covet, which in simple language means thou shalt not be greedy. And again, it's usually our eyes that lead us into greed. The blind don't have that same problem. But greed is one of the things we're being taught through our commercial advertising and in many other ways. And it says greed, which is idolatry, is listed there. Social injustices are also listed. Have you ever heard it said that the New Testament doesn't condemn slavery? Well, actually it does. If you look up Paul's first letter to Timothy, in chapter 1 he lists the things that could take a person to hell. He, he mentions the murder of parents. Well, now that's pretty serious, isn't it? But then straight away he mentions slave traders. And by the way, if you thought that slavery had disappeared from our world, you better think again. It's still very much alive. But there are much more refined sins in that list of 120. Uh, unbelief is classed as a sin that could take you to hell. But one of the most surprising is in the second last list in Revelation 21. And it says there, the cowardly, the cowardly go to the lake of fire. Now what does cowardly mean? It means those who for fear of people have not done or said what they knew to be right. Those who have simply been cowards in standing up for what is right. How does that grab you? And of course there are the more subtle sins of pride and other things. It is clear that there are many, many things that could take a person to hell. There is also the surprise that things a person hasn't done, that unbelievers haven't done, could take them there. Paul says that those who do not know God or those who do not obey the gospel. Now those are two different groups. Those who do not know God are those who haven't heard the gospel, but do know from their conscience and creation that there is a God to whom they are accountable. But those who do not obey the gospel are those who have heard, but who've refused it. And only God knows who is in those two groups. Well now, I'm sure that so far, everybody here who's a Christian agrees with what I've said. Yes, such things put a person in danger of hell. They are on the broad way that leads to destruction.
But now comes the shock. The Bible also talks about careless saints being in danger of hell. And this is a real shock. You see, most of what we know about hell comes from the lips of Jesus. And within the four Gospels, almost everything about hell is in the Gospel of Matthew. Now, this is very, very significant. Why is there so little about hell in Luke and nothing about hell in Mark and next to nothing about it in John? Why is it all in Matthew from cover to cover? Well, this is where we need the Bible study that looks at books as a whole. You see, there are four Gospels. Two of them were written for sinners and two for saints. Two are written for unbelievers and two for believers. Do you know which? John was not written to unbelievers. It's the most unsuitable to give an unbeliever. How they get past the first 18 verses and still understand it, I don't know. We're just hoping they'll get as far as John 3.16 and that might do the trick. But John is written for believers, mature believers. And Matthew is written for believers, but immature believers. And it's only Mark and Luke that are written for sinners. They're the two Gospels you should use in evangelism. Matthew is a manual of discipleship. And Matthew doesn't just tell you what Jesus did. He collects Jesus' teaching and he puts all the teaching together in five major blocks, obviously to imply that Jesus is the new Moses. Moses having us, given us five books of the law, now we have Jesus' five books on the kingdom, if you like. And the theme is the kingdom in all five. In the first, which we call the Sermon on the Mount, the theme is the lifestyle of the kingdom. Then we have the mission of the kingdom in the second, chapter 10. Then we have the um, growth of the kingdom in chapter 13. Then we have the community of the kingdom in chapter 18. Then we have the future of the kingdom in chapter 24 and 25. And all those five blocks of teaching are addressed not to sinners but to disciples. And it's a shock to realize that Jesus rarely, if ever, talked about hell to sinners. He gave a warning twice to Pharisees about hell, but every other warning he gave was given to born-again disciples who had received him and believed in his name and been born of God. That is the shock. Because I'm afraid this unbiblical cliche, once saved, always saved, is everywhere. But here we have the solemn thought that Jesus reserved most of his warnings about hell for his own followers, for those who were committed to him, for those who believed in him. Now, do you appreciate the significance of that? I believe one of the main reasons why preaching hell fell into disrepute was that it was preached by Christians who had no fear of it themselves. Do you understand what I'm saying? It was a kind of, you're going to hell, I'm not, I'm going to heaven. And that kind of preaching is arrogant and offensive in the extreme. And I believe no one is ready to preach on hell unless they fear that having preached to others, they may be thrown away themselves. And it is believers who need to think about hell. It is the disciples of Christ who most need this message. Now, I've explained that in full in my book. That's why it'll be such a shock. Because this country is full of Christians who think I'm in no risk of finishing up there. Therefore, we need to ask, what kind of thing could lead a disciple of Jesus to hell? And here, the surprise is that whereas with care carefree sinners, the emphasis on, is on what they do and a little on what they don't do. With disciples, careless saints, the emphasis is more on what they don't do. Now, if you study the Sermon on the Mount, it is a teaching for Christians. It's not for sinners, it's not for unbelievers. It's almost impossible for believers, never mind unbelievers. And it's for those who are the sons of the kingdom. And it tells us that in the kingdom there is to be no anger, no lust, no worry. That's why you never see a Christian worried, you must have noticed. <laughs> now why do we laugh? Why do we treat that as a joke? 
See, Jesus said, in my kingdom, the sons don't worry because that's a libel on their father in heaven. It's saying, my father cares more about his garden and his pets than he does about his kids. He feeds the flowers, the birds of the air. He clothes the flowers of the field. But me, I'm just his child. I have to worry. That's libel. And when you read the Sermon on the Mount, that is a description of how Jesus expects his disciples to live. To say yes when they mean yes and no when they mean no. Not to get divorced and remarried. Not to pay back evil for evil. And yet there are at least five warnings in the Sermon on the Mount about hell. I've got a lot of books on my shelf expounding the Sermon on the Mount. Not one of them ever mentions that a disciple is in danger of hell. Yet Jesus said, if you call someone a fool, you're in danger of hell fire. If you look at a woman with lust, you're heading there. And when he finished this teaching for disciples, he said, now there are two ways you can travel. There's a broad way that leads to destruction and there's a narrow way that leads to life. And he's speaking to his own followers. This is terribly important. And then when you get through to Matthew 25, which is entirely addressed to the twelve on the Sermon on the Mount, he talks about the virgins whose lamps ran out of oil, about the man who buried his talent, and about those who did not visit him when he was in prison or clothe him when he was naked. All things not done. Do you notice that? All things neglected. That's all. Not bad things, not crimes, not vices. Just things not done that should have been done. Now, I cannot get round this straight teaching. You see, what Jesus is saying is this. Two things are needed to escape hell. One is forgiveness and the other is holiness. And one of the clearest examples of this teaching is that in Luke's Gospel, Jesus told a story of a feast to which people were invited, but they made excuses. One said, I've bought some oxen and I must try them out. Another said, I've married a wife. Another said, I've bought a field and I must go and inspect it. And they didn't come. So they the host of the feast was angry and said, go out into the highways and byways, tell anybody to come, my house shall be full. It's a wonderful story to preach the gospel through. Come and take your place, there's a place for you at the table. And it's in Luke's gospel that you find that story for sinners. When you read the same story in Matthew, there is a subtle twist. The story ends with everybody accepting the invitation and coming to the feast, but one man turns up without wedding clothes. He doesn't bother to change his clothes. And the end of the story is that that man finishes in outer darkness and with weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Matthew is addressed to believers. To unbelievers, the message is, come, there's room for you at the feast. To believers, the message is, now you come in the right clothes. Change your dirty clothes. Put on the righteousness that's available for you. And those who don't change their clothes are at the last turned away from the feast. I remember reading Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan and being greatly struck by a sentence right at the end where Pilgrim arrives at the Jordan River, the Black River of Death, and his companion is scared of this river and he turns away and says, I'm going to try and find another way across and he walks down a side path. And John Bunyan writes, and so I saw in my dream that there is a road to hell even from the gates of heaven. Now I believe, and I say this, from my heart, I believe that the church of today needs this message more than ever. Why should the Lord be sending such a message of repentance to Christians today? It's an extraordinary thing. It's a message that should be going to sinners. Why is it coming to the church? I think because we've forgotten that we are in danger. Let's take the clearest warning that Jesus ever gave he said, don't fear those who can kill your body and afterwards do nothing else to you. 
Rather fear him who can ruin your body and soul in hell. Who was he talking to? Sinners? No. Pharisees? No. He was talking to the twelve apostles when he was sending them out to be missionaries. And he didn't tell them to tell others about hell. He said, now you fear hell. As you go out to proclaim the kingdom, to raise the dead and cleanse the leper and cast out demons and heal the sick and proclaim the kingdom has come, you fear hell. And I believe one of the missing factors in much worship today is the fear of God. Have you noticed that? There's an awful lot of familiarity with God. Not so much fear of God. I believe one of the reasons is that believers no longer fear hell. Because the two are tied very closely together. Fear him who can destroy body and soul in hell. Now that's a sobering message. But I believe it's a much needed one. Every writer of the New Testament has a warning about the danger of losing what you've found in Christ. I take those warnings desperately seriously. When Jesus said, abide in me, I am the true vine, you are the branches. He said, branches that do not abide in me, that do not stay in me, are cut out and are burned. I take that quite literally. And Paul said, and you too will be cut off like the Jews. You too will be cut off if you do not continue in God's kindness. This is not salvation by works. It's salvation by continued faith. Because forgiveness comes by faith and holiness comes by faith. But they both need to be appropriated. And God is offering us everything we need to be ready for heaven. But there are too many who have accepted the invitation to the feast who are not changing their clothes. That's the message I bring to you from Matthew's Gospel. Well, now for some good news. No reason whatever why any, any of us should finish up in hell. Do you know why? First, we have the affection of the Father on our side. God loves us. He doesn't want anyone to finish up useless rubbish in his universe. He has done everything he possibly could to save us from that. What more could he have done? And he never prepared hell for us. He prepared hell for those angels, not us. God has no pleasure in throwing anybody away. He has pain when he has to do it. A picture of a, a revengeful God getting his own back on sinners by throwing them into the lake of fire, that's a libel on God. He has no pleasure in the death of the wicked, none at all. It must cause him immense grief that anyone made in his image, should have to be thrown away. And we have the atonement of Jesus with us too. Do you know that Jesus descended into hell, not after he died, but before? He descended into hell for three hours, from noon until three o'clock. On that cross, Jesus was in hell. How do I know? Well, very simply, there was total darkness, no natural light at all, couldn't see a thing. And it was then that he cried out, I thirst, I thirst. And above all, it was then that he cried out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's hell. And Jesus went through hell so that you need never go there. And he did that to save you from it. And the third thing that's on your side is the assistance of the Holy Spirit. You say, well, I can never be holy. I can never be good enough for heaven. Yes, you can. Because God gave you supernatural power. There's one thing a Christian ought never to say is, I can't help it. There's a little word in Titus that says this, he has given us the grace to say no. Very simple verse. Look, God loves you. Jesus died for you. The Spirit is available to you. You can not only be forgiven, you can be made ready for heaven. It was Charles Wesley who wrote a famous hymn. It has one verse in it. A charge to keep I have a God to glorify, a never dying soul to save and fit it for the sky. 
And that last line is just as important as the other three. See, we're called not to get people to make decisions. We're called to make disciples and to teach them how to live the way that Jesus taught. It's a long job. You can't be done in five minutes at the end of a meeting. It's a lifetime's job. But that is what Jesus is saying in Matthew's Gospel. You look up all his teaching on hell and you'll find that almost every bit of it was not given to sinners, but given to those who'd left all and followed him and who were committed to him. Now I hope that sobers you up. I know it's raised a lot of questions. I can see it on your faces. Go and search the scriptures. Don't accept anything I say unless you can find it there. But look up every warning he gave and ask, who was he talking to at the time? Who was he warning? But then also, don't let yourself get into that panic or that depression that wakes up every morning and says, am I saved or am I not? You can have an assurance that you're on the way to heaven. But that assurance does not come from a decision you made 20 years ago. It comes from a personal relationship you have now. It says the Spirit himself goes on witnessing with your spirit. And you can be sure when you wake up in the morning that you're on the way. If you're walking with the Lord and in the Spirit, you will have an assurance in your heart you're heading for heaven. It's not a guarantee that you'll arrive. It's an assurance you're on the way. One of the first things that happens to you when you sin is that you lose your assurance, right? When you get out of the way, when you get out of relationship, stay in that relationship and you can walk in that daily assurance. I'm on my way. You see, salvation in Scripture is a way. It's not an instantaneous thing. And anybody who repents has put a foot on the way and is walking on the way. And we're on the way to glory. The Spirit wants to give us that assurance of God's love, that he wants us to make it, that he's on our side. There's nothing else can separate you from his love. Nothing. Only you. But if you continue in his love, as Paul says, you will not be cut off. The fact that two and a half million left Egypt and only two arrived in Canaan is used by three different writers of the New Testament as a warning for believers. He doesn't want to save us from only. He wants to save us too. He wants to get us to heaven and he wants to get us ready for heaven so that when we arrive, it's the saints who go marching in. Well, that's probably the most serious thing and I think probably a surprise to many of you. You didn't expect to hear that. You thought I was going to tell you that all those sinners out there are heading for hell and in great danger. They are. And it's a motivation to us to go and rescue them while we can. But having said that, keep the fear of it in your own heart lest having preached to them, you be cast away yourself. So hell is a serious topic and it has a profound effect on Christians. It affects our worship. I believe it will affect our worship in two ways. First, it will bring us to a, a profounder gratitude to God for what he's done for us. When you take bread and wine at communion, you'll be so thankful. You'll want to say, thank you, thank you, thank you. In Greek, you would say, Eucharisto, Eucharisto, Eucharisto. That's what Eucharist means. It means it's a thank you that he would go through hell so that I need not go there. It will produce a gratitude, but it will also produce a reverence and a fear of God will be restored to the church. And that will not just show in worship, it will show in holiness too. Because when you're not afraid that sin will cause you to lose what you've got, you won't take it so seriously. It would be totally unfair of God to send an unbeliever to hell for adultery but shut his eyes when a believer persists in it, wouldn't it? And yet many are saying, I'm all right. Saying, well, she may be a prostitute and she may be on drugs but praise the Lord when she was nine years old she made the great decision. That kind of talk is crazy talk. New Testament says, follow after holiness without which no man will see the Lord will have an effect on our evangelism. We're not just trying to get, bring people a little happiness. We're not just trying to give them a solution to their daily problems. We're rescuing them from hell. That's what evangelism is. From a useless, godless eternity, that's what we're after. We're not just trying to do them a good turn or 
add a little nice dimension to the life. You should come to church. We're very warm there. It's very friendly. You'd enjoy it. That's not what we're after. We're not after getting people into a religious club. We're snatching people from the fire. That's always been a major motivation in missionary work. It'll affect us in so many ways. And finally, those who fear hell find it much easier to face martyrdom. When Jesus said, don't fear those who can kill your body, rather fear him who can destroy body and soul in hell. He was saying the cure for fear of man is fear of God. The cure for little fears is the big fear. And that's true. You lose your little fears when you've got a big fear. And the big fear is the fear of finishing up there. And when you're more afraid of that than anything, you can face anything or anyone. Those who fear God fear no one and nothing else. I think of one of the early martyrs, Polycarp, was his name of Smyrna. And they threatened to burn him alive on a red-hot sheet of iron. And Polycarp said, You threaten me with the fire that kills the body? I fear the fire that destroys me forever. He went to his death. It puts courage into Christians. If you fear God, it cures your other fears. You don't need therapy for all the other ones then. You can fear the Lord. There's as much about the fear of God in the New Testament as in the Old. It's part of Christian living. For our God is a consuming fire. Therefore, let us approach him with reverence and awe as we worship him. Well, that's enough about hell. I want to get you to heaven. So, in the next talk, we're going to go for glory. Amen.